we all get our chance to have a say and um, this is my chance. Making our voice heard is really is more important than ever. I'm just tired of having Doug Ford in office. No matter who you're voting for, please just get out and vote. It's so important for Ontario. I hope lots of people get out and vote today. They showed up at 9.45 and they hadn't even opened the doors yet. So I thought I was going to be voting where I live. It disrupted my routine. Today is election day in Ontario. More than 10 million people are eligible to cast their ballots to determine who will form the next Ontario government. Voters have been heading to the polls since 9 this morning, where some ran into technical issues and long lines. We'll have you covered this hour with the latest updates. PC leader Doug Ford has run a front-runner's campaign leading in the polls from wire to wire. The question tonight appears to be, can the PCs add to their seat count? Lisa Shing is live for us at PC headquarters in Etobicoke. And Lisa, the stage is set for the PCs. What they hope tonight is a big, big party there. Yeah, they certainly do hope that, Dwight. Uh, you can't see, but over to my left is the Yes Express, uh, Doug Ford's campaign bus that he's been riding around over the last four weeks. And over this shoulder here, as you can see, balloons are set uh, and ready to be dropped, hopefully, uh, at the end of the night tonight. And uh, as for PC leader Doug Ford, uh, spent a bit of a quiet day, uh, voted this morning with his wife Carla, uh, stayed in his riding throughout the day and of course we do expect him here tonight we're told that he's set to speak on stage uh, around 10 o'clock or shortly afterwards but uh, to me it really looks like here they're setting up for a party tonight so lisa now that the campaigning is done how are the pcs feeling about the job they did this campaign yeah, so I really think they're feeling confident going into tonight. Uh, you know, one person tells me cautiously optimistic, but I get the sense that uh, a little more confident than that, uh, judging from the campaign they ran. And of course, the fact that they came out as front runners right off the top. And then that really didn't change. That lead did not change all that much over the next four weeks of campaigning. Uh, really, what they ran was a tightly controlled campaign, a safe campaign that was tailored to PC leader Doug Ford. They had him visiting construction sites. You know, there was a theme going on uh, about the fact that uh, projecting the image that he was for the workers, essentially. Uh, all this to... Uh, really bring voters past the pandemic to allow them to forget and, and motivate them to want to move on from the pandemic and whether or not uh, they were successful we'll we'll find out a bit later tonight but they say they are confident going in and uh, not just in winning but winning a majority so we'll see about that lisa shing at pc party headquarters tonight thank you lisa Andrew Horvath will gather tonight with NDP supporters in Hamilton. That's where Lorenda Redekop is live. And Lorenda, a lot at stake tonight for Andrew Horvath in her fourth election as party leader. That's right, Dwight. And for some of the supporters who come here, this will be their fourth time coming to the same place with Andrea Horvath as NDP leader. So what kind of speech will they be hearing tonight from her? Will it be a concession speech? Will it be a victory speech? Well, the polls don't seem to indicate that. All along, consistently, they've put her in third place. She marked her ballot here in Hamilton earlier today. It was this morning. Could it be the last time that she puts that X next to her own name? Lots of questions here. And every election as leader, she has improved her party's performance. Last time she became official opposition leader. Can she maintain that or perhaps even improve that? But last time we have to remember that four years ago, the Liberals, they were in a real state of collapse. There was so much anger in this province towards the party and specifically Kathleen Wynne. So it was a much different situation. What we've seen from Andrea Horvath and the NDP, uh, they, she was the prime voice opposing Doug Ford as opposition leader. She talked a lot about the pandemic issues, the situation in long-term care. But what we saw is that overall, people seem to approve of Doug Ford's handling of the pandemic. And so they've struggled to try to 
get their message out to people. In the last week of the campaign, what we have seen from the NDP is that they have really sharpened their message, saying stop the cuts. They've been attacking both the former Liberal government and also the PCs. And Andrew Horvath has seemed energized. That was after having COVID, the cancelled, a first attempt to head to northern Ontario, then a second attempt, that was cancelled as well. This time it was issues with the plane. So certainly she's had some bad luck, but she did come back energized. So will it translate into votes? Dwight? Yeah, they need to shore up, not shed seats tonight, and we will be watching that closely. Thank you, Lorenda. Now, the Liberals are looking to regain official party status after their implosion four years ago. Travis Danraj is live at Liberal HQ in Vaughan. Travis, a lot on the line for the Libs tonight and for their leader. Yeah, 100 percent Dwight but Stephen Del Duca knew that this was going to be a, a tall order when he became the leader in March 2020 he, he knew that there were a lot of problems that the party was facing of course in 2018 as Lorenda Lisa he were talking about uh, the, the Liberals face a really crushing defeat uh, weren't even at official party status they also were 10 million dollars in debt when Stephen Del Duca became the leader he was able to get them out of debt will he be able to rebuild this party at <laughs> Queen's Park will they be able to become the official opposition or even Stephen Del Duca as the Premier? Well, we'll find out all those answers tonight. But another big question is his seat right here in the riding of Vaughan Woodbridge. Uh, that is up in the air right now, whether or not he'll be able to win that. We were able to speak to Stephen Del Duca just shortly as he arrived for sound check. Here's a bit of what he said about how he's feeling today. Yeah, I'm feeling great. Gonna, gonna go keep working hard down to the wire for the people of Ontario are and for Vaughn Woodbridge. Thank you. Are you gonna confident that you'll win your seat tonight here? I'm confident that I'll keep working hard and I'm looking forward to a great night. Thank you. So as you can see there, uh, pretty quick comments to the media and we may not be hearing from Stephen Nel Duca, other than when he goes at the podium and, and speaks to supporters and campaign workers here uh, at the Paramount event space in Woodbridge a little bit later tonight, uh, after the results come in, and it's clear whether or not he is the premier or the leader of the official opposition or the third party, and whether or not he wins his seat. They're keeping the media situation quite uh, tight and under control here. He's not going to be doing one-on-one -on -one interviews, and we're told he's not going to be doing a scrum either. So his future as leader of this party, we may not find that out until a couple of days from now, Dwight. Yeah, not sure that I'm confident. Sounded that confident, Travis. Big night up there in Vaughan Woodbridge. Thank you. Let's go to Guelph now, where they're hoping to keep that part of the map green tonight. Chris Glover is at Green Party leader Mike Shriners HQ. Chris, the big storyline there, can the Greens grow? Absolutely. The big goal for Mike Schreiner tonight is going to be having a buddy with him at Queen's Park if he's able to go back. They made history in the last election, winning Guelph with Mike Schreiner taking 45% of the vote here. And they are certainly hoping that they can send another Green MPP to the Ontario Legislature. If that were to happen, there's a couple ridings that they're watching. One in particular is in Toronto, uh, University Rosedale, the former environmental commissioner. That's a role that Doug Ford axed when he took power. And uh, that candidate, Diane Sachs, is running in Toronto's University Rosedale. The party is certainly hoping that that could be a possibility. The other one that is pot potentially more likely is Perry Sound Muskoka. And Matt Richter is running for the Greens there. He is a school teacher as well as a small business owner. He's run before, and the party is really pumping a lot of resources into this riding. They have had Mike Schreiner up there more times than any other riding other than, of course, Guelph here. And uh, they've also had some federal help as well. Elizabeth May, the former federal Green Party leader was just there at the end of last week. And so certainly they are mobilizing there. They are hoping that that could be a second option for uh, an MPP of the Greens to head to Queens Park. But really, uh, Mike Schreiner already has a lot that he is proud of and a lot to celebrate, just even getting into the conversation in the way that he has, Dwight. Uh, this, of course, was the very first time that he was able to be a part of the televised leaders debate. He's been leader of the Green Party since 2009, but because of that historic election in 2018, he was finally invited to be on that stage with the other leaders. So really, he has a lot to celebrate already, and tonight he is hoping for a 
little bit of company if he's able to get back to Queen's Park. Yeah, and you're right. He had a strong debate, too. Should be interesting to watch. Thank you for that, Chris. Thank you. Our senior reporter at Queen's Park, Mike Crawley, will be in studio as the results roll in for us tonight. He joins us now to talk about what to watch for as the story of this election unfolds. Mike, how quickly could we get a decision tonight? Uh, Dwight, we're expecting to see results just minutes after the polls close at 9. So, uh, folks, you're definitely going to be wanting to watch before that. Uh, we have the countdown uh, before the polls close uh, starting at 8 o'clock. Uh, and then that's because uh, Elections Ontario counts the vast majority of people's ballots uh, through electronic counting machines. So uh, we are expecting to see those results super quick, and there could be a result projected by the CBC News decision desk very shortly after that. Now, it's majority or bust for Doug Ford tonight. What will you be watching for to determine whether the PCs are on track for a majority? So, Dwight, a key benchmark that I look for is uh, what's going on with the seats that the PCs won by the slimmest margins the last time. So that's, the, let's say, 15 or so seats in which they're potentially the most vulnerable to losing. If I'm looking at that and I'm comparing it to, uh, you know, 2018, if they're winning those seats tonight, they are definitely on track for a majority. And then the question becomes only how big is that majority going to be? How many seats are they also uh, eating into uh, the NDP's total from the last time? So if the PCs do hold on to a majority, the big question, of course, who then becomes the official opposition? You just alluded to that. What should we be looking for in the fight between the Libs and the NDP then? Yeah, uh, look, the NDP's got a pretty big cushion over the Liberals uh, from the last election. You know, they took 40 seats compared to seven for the Liberals. So the Liberals have got a lot of ground to, to make up. But if the New Democrats are losing seats to the Conservatives, let's say in places like southwestern Ontario or maybe northern Ontario, and they're also losing seats to the Liberals in Toronto, then it could be touch and go over uh, who becomes uh, official opposition. What happens tonight could, of course, determine the future of some of the leaders. What are the chances we get a big announcement from one of their speeches this evening? Well, Dwight, I would say the chances of uh, Andrea Horvath announcing that she's going to be stepping down as uh, the NDP leader are pretty strong. I've been talking to a bunch of New Democrats over the last few days who seem to have a consensus that, that uh, Andrea Horvath's time as leader is up and that she is aware of this. So uh, pretty much uh, whatever the result is going to be, I think uh, we can expect to hear that. A different story, though, from uh, Stephen Del Duca. He was sending a message of uh, defiance almost, you know, saying he's going to stay around no matter what the result is. And look, if the result is really bad for him, he's going to have some explaining to do as to why uh, he should uh, stay on as, as party leader, you know, especially if uh, the, the Liberals are just like, barely keeping uh, third party status in the legislature. Yeah, worried about his party's fortunes and his own fortunes in his writing tonight. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome, Dwight. Some voters have seen hurdles to get their votes in today, from long wait times to moved polling stations. Ali Shassan has been speaking with voters. So what's the latest out there, Ali? Well, Dwight, after some glitches and last-minute changes, Elections Ontario would like everyone to know that voting is now going smoothly. But that wasn't always the case. And, you know, voters made their frustrations heard. But what is Election Day without a little passion at the polls? It's not always easy to know who you're going to vote for, and sometimes it's not all that easy to vote. That was the case for some people today in Mississauga. We're experiencing technical difficulties right now. We're being told it's being worked on, and that we don't have a timeline for you guys. At about 25 after 9, I think people were starting to get frustrated. I know I was because I, I really needed to get to work. You didn't get a chance to vote. No, I'm really hoping that after work today, I'm going to have an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to go back and and uh, make my feelings known with my vote. Elections Ontario has acknowledged there were some technical issues with the computer tabulators today, including in Ottawa. I showed up at 9:45 and they hadn't even opened the doors yet. They never came out and talked to anybody. Really? They were late, but didn't say anything. That was frustrating. I have a baby, so I had to bring her back to get her fed and go down for a nap. Uh, so I left her at home with my husband and then came back to vote. But tabulators were back up and tabulating in the afternoon, which got people moving again. So you just voted. Yeah. How did that experience go? It's good. 
not so good for some in Toronto center. I thought I was going to be voting where I lived. And I had to come here now and it just, just it disrupted my routine. Some were surprised by last minute changes to polling locations. We do voting. That's what you want us to do. Make us happy. There are those who persevered, of course, showing up early. I think it's really, really important to find time to vote. I'm here nice and early in the morning. Got, it, got up extra early specifically for this. To have a say, even to set an example. Like my mom says, you know, every count counts, and I want to make sure my daughter, you know, also keep that up. What did you think of the experience? Well, now that I know how to do it, I think it'd be, like, pretty fun. But, like, it seems pretty confusing, but I think it'd be good in the future. Yeah, how old are you? I'm nine. Okay, so we've got some time to figure out all the kinks, and I think it'll work smoothly by the time you're 18 and you can vote. Yeah, can't wait. So that's the kind of election day energy you like to see, right? Now, for those eager to get out and vote among the after work crowd, you have until 9 o'clock tonight. Coming up a little later in the show, I'll give you an update on how the lines are looking. Dwight. Uh, them thinking about their civic duty nice and early, Ali. Thank you for that. And stay with us for more live election coverage this hour. Then join us back here at 8 p.m. for the last hour of the election countdown. And starting at 9, join Vashi Kapalis and myself for CBC's election special featuring analysis from Mike Crawley and results from Eric Grenier. While it's impossible to predict, the last election was called within the first half hour of the show, so you might want to tune in early. And Colette, as I was voting this morning, I mm -hmm. met a lady at the voting station. I guarantee you she's watching now. She says she watches every night, and her favorite part of the show is this part. Oh, when we get to talk to each other. <laughs> when you admonish me for complaining about the weather, etc. Yes, she says she loves it. She waits for it. Oh, I love it. Well, let's say hello to her then. And here we go because we're going to do something special here. We still have a little bit of time if you haven't been out to the polls. I almost feel guilty because when I went this morning, there was no lineup at all. And it just was so smooth. And I hope uh, that happens for you if you're still heading out. So still a few showers, but they're really exiting east. So drying out. Uh, certainly downtown, that's already happened. But it's turning eastward that is drying out as well. Well, 7 to 8, okay, the temperature comes down a little bit, 18 degrees, still really comfortable in our sunset. And, oh, not quite 9 o'clock, but getting there. Uh, so you're still going to have daylight hours if you're going to be heading out there, all right? And now, current temperatures around the region, we're seeing a 17 in Hamilton and St. Catharines. Otherwise, we have that 18 to 19 degrees. There you go. The radar showing you how that wet weather is really exiting. And it looks a little more dramatic, frankly, on the radar than what we really have experienced because a lot of this is kind of drying up in the atmosphere before it even reaches the ground. So not all of that is actually happening. It's breaking apart as well as it's hitting the west end of the lake. So we'll see that kind of pushing through that little disturbance and drying out. So then the setup for tomorrow morning is a lot of sunshine. And then watch what happens in just a few little spots. We get just enough with that colder air aloft and some of that daytime heating for a few little pop-up showers. Shouldn't be a big deal, but just be aware uh, that that's in there. Otherwise, a very fair day, fair evening as we're getting rid of those showers too, Dwight. And just in case you think we missed it, we did catch your election day graphic there. Yeah, Thank you for that. Look at that. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Coming up while the election is in full swing here in Ontario, over in Britain, it's the start of a four day party, all in honor of the Queen's record setting seven decades as the British monarch. We'll bring you more sights and sounds from the packed day of celebrations right after the break. The man who shot and killed four people at a medical building in Oklahoma yesterday had been a patient of one of the victims, a surgeon who had performed back surgery on him. Tulsa's police chief spoke about the deadly incident at a press conference today. We have also found a letter on the suspect which made it clear that he came in with the intent to kill Dr. Phillips and anyone who got in his way. The suspect, Michael Lewis, bought the rifle hours before opening fire. He blamed Dr. Preston Phillips for continuing back pain after a recent surgery. He had called the clinic about the problem repeatedly and saw the surgeon about it on 
Tuesday. Lewis died of a gunshot wound after killing Dr. Phillips, another doctor, a receptionist, and a patient. It's believed he shot himself. A historic signing on the Signica First Nation in southern Alberta. The Prime Minister say the Signica chief formalized a compensa compensation deal rather worth more than a billion dollars. It was here at Blackfoot Treaty Flats that Treaty 7 was signed in 1877 by the first Chief Crowfoot. When he spoke at the time, the chief said that the Blackfoot people are the children of the plains, and that the plains are your home. He said that he hoped that the government would be charitable to his people. But as we all know, during the 1910 surrender and subsequent actions, the government acted dishonorably. The settlement resolves one of the longest-running land claims in Canadian history. The money is meant to compensate the Siksika for the loss of their 40,000 hectares of their land more than a century ago. The federal government took it unlawfully to benefit prairie settlers and to build the Canadian Pacific Railway. Celebrations kicked off this morning in the UK for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, honoring her record-setting 70 years on the throne. The monarch and members of the royal family watched the colorful festivities from the balcony, at, from the balcony rather, at Buckingham Palace. Chris Brown has highlights. On a day when Britain looked its best, the most significant moment came on the balcony of Buckingham Palace featuring four generations of royals. The Queen was joined by three future kings, her son Prince Charles, his son Prince William, and his son eight-year-old Prince George. Her big smile conveyed more than any words could. The commemoration of 70 years of her reign was a precisely organized celebration that went off precisely as planned. It began with the over 260-year-old tradition of trooping the colour. Charles, William and the Queen's daughter, Princess Anne, led the procession to Horse Guards Parade. The Queen used to ride herself or came by carriage, but at 96 years old on this day, she watched with her cousin, the Duke of Kent. This is Britain's first Platinum Jubilee and maybe the only one ever. For some here, it's a chance to say thank you to the Queen for a job well done. For others, it's almost a farewell. These Canadians hope not. There's plenty of life left in the old girl. Definitely. <laughs> She's not on her way out. I don't care what anyone says. She is an amazing lady. The Queen has worked hard all her life. And it's nice to, you know, celebrate it. All in all, a strong display of the monarchy's future is what the Queen was striving for, says this royal expert. We've got three heirs to succeed her, Charles, William and George. So the monarchy actually in that respect is in pretty good shape. I think that's the Queen projecting that image of unity, a big family, a family united. The Queen appeared most engaged by the Royal Air Force fly past with her great-grandson, four-year-old Prince Louis, covering his ears from the noise of the aircraft. But the palace said the event also gave the Queen some discomfort, so she'll skip Friday's church service. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Coming up, Ottawa's former police chief calls for changes on Parliament Hill following last winter's tumultuous Freedom Convoy. This was an unprecedented national security crisis for which our institutions were not fully prepared. We'll bring you the highlights of Peter Slowly's first public comments since his high-profile resignation. Stay with us. A man who murdered his on-again, off-again girlfriend and two of her teenage children has been given a third sentence of life in prison. On March 14th of 2018, Corey Fenn stabbed 39-year-old Casimira Pejanovsky to death in a rage after she broke up with him. He then killed her 15-year-old son, Roy, minutes later. 
Five hours after that, he also killed her 13-year-old daughter, Vanelia. Fenn had been found guilty of all three counts of second-degree murder. The judge in the case had given Fenn two life sentences but was awaiting a Supreme Court ruling on consecutive sentencing before delivering the third. Fenn is now serving three life sentences but will be eligible for parole in 25 years. Ottawa's former police chief says authorities weren't equipped to deal with the so-called Freedom Convoy protest in the winter. Peter slowly shared his views during an appearance before a parliamentary committee today. Rafi Bujakanian has more. Two weeks in, the protest convoy ended the three-decade career of the former head of Ottawa police. Today, despite public pronouncements by the movement's organizers on intending to stay, Peter slowly insisted the force did not have adequate intel on what they'd be facing. The intelligence, um, the totality of the experience within the Canadian policing and national security uh, agencies had never uh, seen and dealt with uh, a demonstration, occupation, illegal actions of the nature in and around the events of the Freedom Convoy. Slowly left the job under immense pressure and accusations of inaction in mid-February, just a day after the federal government invoked the Emergencies Act providing police extra powers to end the protest. The former chief today said the only recent event he could compare to the convoy was not in this country. January 6th in the United States, Washington DC would be a closer Aspect. But this parliamentary committee is just as preoccupied with what comes next, specifically on the future of Wellington Street around Parliament Hill. We really need to think about hardening um, and reducing access while still allowing the charter rights freedoms for protest and gathering, etc. Um, incrementalism in policing in general I have fought against for the majority of my career. Wellington's been shut to traffic ever since police removed the convoy. With the area also including the Prime Minister's office, there are suggestions restrictions should be tightened and made permanent. Rafi Bujikani, CBC News, Ottawa. The Toronto Police Service is lifting its COVID-19 vaccination mandate for employees. That means more than 100 officers and civilian staff who are currently on unpaid leave will be returning to duty later this month. Greg Ross has more. Starting June 21st, proof of COVID-19 vaccination is no longer required for current employees of the Toronto Police. I think it's reasonable and I understand why they've decided to remove the mandates. Fahad Razak is the director of Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table. He says it's the right time for a move like this by Toronto Police. With the vast majority of the population vaccinated, which is fantastic, of the remaining people who are unvaccinated, the majority of those have now become infected. The transmission risk and the protection of the vaccine against transmission has now diminished. And that's why this is reasonable. This decision by police may give employees in other fields who have also been laid off a strong legal argument that they should be called back as well, according to this labor lawyer. Other people who are laid off and haven't been called back can say, look, the times have changed. Public policy's changed. Public safety's changed. It is no, no longer unsafe to have in the workplace unvaccinated. Some major banks have also lifted vaccine requirements, but not all workplaces are the same. They are not groups that are dealing with high risk populations in an indoor setting, like, for example, healthcare. So the vaccine requirements remain in place for hospitals like where I am today. Vaccine mandates also remain in place with the city of Toronto. In a statement to CBC News, a spokesperson said the city will continue to monitor and assess its COVID-19 vaccination policy regarding the city's workplace and public health environments. Unlike TPS, the city didn't put unvaccinated staff on unpaid leave. 458 employees were terminated for failing to comply with vaccine mandates, and the city has no plans to ever call them back, telling us those positions have now either been filled or are in the process of being filled. The city says some of those employees are fighting their termination, either in court or through arbitration with their unions. Do they have a good chance? No, because most of the arbitration cases so far, the employers won on precisely the same issue. So no, I don't think they have a good chance. Both the city and Toronto police say that COVID-19 vaccinations will still be required for all new hires. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. 
When the pandemic first hit, many commuters stopped taking the bus or train. Yet despite record high gasoline prices and many more workers returning to the office, public transit has still not bounced back. Kyle Bax finds out why. These trains should be full. Activity in the city's core is nearly back to normal, but transit use is sluggish, about half of what it should be. Calgary is heavily influenced by people who like to drive. And our downtown market has a lot of people that historically have always wanted to drive to work. Across the country, public transit use is increasing, but is still about 50% lower compared to 2019, even with more workers heading back to the office. The nature of work and work-related travel has changed significantly post-pandemic. Some people work from home or are back in the habit of driving, this professor says, while others are conscious about COVID and wanting more personal space. It'll take at least two, three, four years for us to go back to where we are if we ever go back to where we are. Ridership in small cities is the slowest to recover. Meanwhile, in some parts of the GTA, passenger levels are more than 70% of normal. At this Toronto bus terminal, activity is picking up. There are few empty seats, says this student who's commuting from Mississauga to Ajax for a work internship. I think a lot of people are turning back to work. And so because of that, uh, it's getting you know busier and busier by the day. Transit agencies should prepare now for more passengers, some experts say, especially with rising fuel prices. Suddenly people are going to get really upset about a transit service that is not fast, not convenient, not on time, not getting them to where they need to get to. For now, it's a juggling act for transit agencies, trying to keep costs in check while also providing enough service and routes to entice passengers back. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Calgary. Call it just the perfect day to get out there and mark that X. I know, just some incredible conditions. We had a few of those light showers, but there was very little to it, so it wasn't a big deal. It's still not, and the polls aren't closed yet. Hey, taking a little dip. That is the title I have here for our temperatures over the next few days. So it's not the kind of dip where, oh, it's really hot and humid like we had, and you want to dip into the water. I'm talking about some of this colder air in the eastern sections of the prairies that's wanting to push down here towards southern Ontario. So Friday, we're actually quite fine seasonal but then as we go into Saturday you see basically 20 degrees is yellow and so when you see the colorations yellow starting to turn green you know okay we're in the teens maybe here a little bit or closer to it and then Sunday uh, it's close we still have quite a lot of that cooler air to the north Monday will be interesting it's going to be a battle between that warm air to the south colder air to the north and where the models are not in agreement we're either going to see our temperature spike for that one day or I'm right now writing it that we're actually going to be staying closer to seasonal so we'll see <laughs> who wins that battle and depends who you're pulling for. All right, our current temperatures, we've got 15 in Kingston, 19 in Toronto, and 23 still holding on in Windsor. Nice night for voting there. There are those light showers that were pushing through, still in having some of that active weather and activity into eastern Ontario. And overnight tonight in that region, a few rumbles of thunder possible. But we get into clearing trend, a little bit of fog into southwestern Ontario. We start off with sunshine tomorrow and then clouds building in. And tomorrow afternoon, again, the chance chance of just a few little isolated pop-up showers are in the forecast for us. Looking into Saturday, it looks great. So overnight tonight, there are your readings. We've got nine for St. Catharines, a single digit. So last night it was really comfortable. You know, our dew points are down, so it's not the sticky, the air mass, there's not much moisture, and so it's comfortable. But when they start to get a little cooler like this, if you have the windows open, you might kind of notice that chill into the morning hours. 23 for our high tomorrow, beautiful day in Toronto with just those isolated showers. 21 Saturday, and there's that cooler air on Sunday, so into the weekend, and then we'll be watching Monday there, Dwight, see what happens. Who wins? And yes. who wins tonight? <laughs> there, that too, and, and hence the dip. We can see the dip. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Colette. You're welcome. The countdown is on. Polls close in just over two hours. You'll be able to see the results right here on CBC Television on our election night special starting at 8 o'clock. But we've got more coverage for you coming up. We'll check in on how the vote is going downtown, hear from voters, and take you live to PC headquarters. You're looking at the time lapse of the set being built there. That's next. Stay with us. 
As we head to break, here's a look at where the markets closed today. The TSX was up by 318 points, the Dow also rising by 435, and the dollar climbed to 79.38 cents US. We'll be right back. The voting continues on Election Day across the province, and we are learning some polling stations have had their hours extended. Ali Shassan is at a polling station in the Toronto Centre writing. What's the latest there, Ali? Well, Dwight, I am at the YMCA on Grosvenor downtown here. This is one of a couple of locations in Toronto Centre that changed last minute, and that caused a few headaches uh, for people in this riding. They went to where they thought they needed to vote with what was said on their voting card, but then they were sent here instead. Now, Elections Ontario said um, this had to happen due to unforeseen circumstances, one of them being a fire at one location, a sewer backup at another. Definitely uh, worth making the change, I would say. And now it appears people got the message because the voting here uh, at the YMCA has been going smoothly. Have a listen. Seamless. No line. Uh, very friendly staff. Really good. Yeah, it was pretty easy. I just came in with ID real quick. Uh, they just, I guess, looked me up in the system and everything. And in a couple of minutes, I was done. There's a lot of signs, a lot of staff helping out, guiding people where to go making sure every, everything is flowing smoothly. So the other issue that we saw this morning, to those technical difficulties that we saw with the electronic uh, tabulating uh, voter terminals. Um, so that caused some delays this morning, and I wanted to let you know that uh, a lot of these locations experiencing some ourselves. Apologies for that. Now, the Ontario PCs are hoping the majority of votes will go their way tonight. Let's check back in with Lisa Shing in Etobicoke. A lot of confidence in the PC camp, Lisa. Absolutely a lot of confidence going into tonight, Dwight. Uh, the balloons are up, as you can see, hopefully ready to be dropped uh, in a few hours' time. Time. I'm joined by Michael Diamond, a PC strategist with the campaign. Michael, how are you feeling going into tonight? Look, we're feeling really good. I think, you know, we, we've seen a lot of things in this campaign that make us very uh, hopeful. We've had tremendous candidates across the province working very hard. The leaders work tirelessly and I think it's really connected with voters. And, and you know, so we're, we're going into this just feeling really good. I think some of the things we've seen, like the unprecedented labor support for the PC party, we're really confident is going to help change the map tonight. So uh, we're excited. What kind of campaign do you think you guys ran? Look, I think we ran a very straightforward, honest campaign with voters. We were very clear and very positive about what we wanted to do. And I think the other leaders' messages, they certainly talked about what their plans were for the province, but it always started with saying no, saying no to the 413, saying no to what we were proposing. And we were talking about what we wanted to do, saying yes, what we wanted to build. Uh, so I think that's also something, you know, we're, we were motivating voters with hope, and I, I, I truly believe that will pay off uh, this evening. And also a little bit of a safe campaign, if I may say so, you know, one um, that didn't really take a lot of risks. So was it a lot of playing defense for you guys? Well, I don't think, look, I think if we look at the map after tonight, I don't think it's going to look like we were playing defense. Uh, I, I think it's going to look like we were on the offense uh, when we when we see the uh, uh, sea totals come in. Uh, but, um, but 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 in terms of was it, was it a safe campaign, I think it was a smart campaign. I think we were disciplined. I think we were very clear and concise in what we were offering. So if that's, if that's safe, I'm... I, I don't take that as an insult. I'm very happy that we were safe because I think we were clear and straightforward with voters, and that's really important. And I guess we'll see what happens uh, in a few hours' time from now. Exactly. It's up to the voters now, and there's still time to vote. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that was Michael Diamond, a PC campaign strategist, and uh, we'll send it back to you, Dwight. We'll see what happens here in a few hours. Yeah, we'll see if they were playing offense, as he says. Thank you for that, Lisa. Throughout the election campaign, we have been speaking to voters. One writing we focused on is Humber River Black Creek, which has historically had one of the lowest voter turnouts. Kelda Ewan is in the writing and joins us live from there. Now, Kelda, what's happening there tonight? Well, Dwight. I am here at Black Creek Community Health Center in Jane and Finch, and we have invited members of the community here tonight to take in the live election results with us. Now, we got screens 
set up. We got tables and chairs you can see behind me. Food is on the way and we are expecting people to start arriving in the next hour. Now we have been in this riding of Humber River Black Creek doing stories leading up to this election. Stories around affordability, tenant rights and jobs. Uh, this riding did have one of the lowest voter turnouts in the last provincial election. Uh, only 47 percent of eligible voters went to the polls. That was the lowest turnout in the GTA and the third lowest in the province. But the residents that we've met are very passionate about their community. They're very engaged. They just feel that there's often a disconnect between politicians and the realities that many in this community face. Now, I am joined now by Cheryl Prescott. She's executive director here at the Black Creek Community Health Center. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us and for allowing us to use this space tonight. Now, Cheryl, I know that uh, the last couple of years, it's been uh, really hard for this community. The pandemic, of course, has highlighted and exacerbated many of the social inequities that have long existed. Now, what are the top issues that you would like the next government to address uh, in this after the next election? So as you said, the pandemic only highlighted the issues that were here already in this community. The structural barriers to things like jobs, housing, food insecurity, access to health care. As a community health center, we have seen these issues play out in this community for years. And we would love the new government to really pay some attention to equity, equity of access to care for this community that deserves it so much. There are hardworking people in this community, people who had, were working essential jobs to keep our economy going, to keep us all healthy and happy during the pandemic because they were stocking our shelves and delivering our food. So we really need the new government to think about an equitable response to pandemic recovery as they think about health care in, uh, in the broad sense of things in the, uh, by addressing the social determinants of health. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And this is a conversation that we will be continuing here tonight at the Black Creek Community Health Center as we gather to watch the election results come in. Now, right now, the riding is held by the NDP, but before that, the Liberals held this riding for almost 20 years, and they are trying to get that seat back tonight. Of course, the PCs also hoping to put up a fight. Uh, we'll see what happens. Send it back to you, Dwight. Yeah, that's the first spot. I marked my X at 18. Thank you, Kelda. Well, happy graduation day. Back after two years, I'm Natalie Collada, where in-person convocations are back on. We'll have that story coming up. University of Toronto's new graduates, the school hosted the first convocation ceremony since the start of the pandemic. For students, years of learning took place online. Now they are crossing the stage in person. Natalie Collada has their story. It's a memory Jennifer Zhang and Zahar Zarabi plan to treasure. It feels yeah. surreal because I feel like so many of our classmates we haven't even seen in the past like two plus years because of the pandemic. So it's just really nice, I feel like, to be able to share this special moment uh, together for one. The university's convocation is the first in-person ceremony at the University of Toronto since the pandemic began. Given the state of uh, the pandemic and the guidance that we have from public health, uh, agencies. We believe that this is a, a safe time to do it and we know that our students really want to get back in person. Complete with family cheering them on. We started in high school. It was a good luck goodbye at the like a good before luck, school. Good luck. Good yeah, I had a different one for each of my boys. Away, handshake. Yeah. It's really nice to have family around for this moment, and I feel like they have contributed to this just almost as much as we have. Alessandra Cecacci. The moment represents years of hard work, and for some of these medical students, the added challenge of the pandemic brought clarity. Doing clerkship during COVID really highlighted what was important, and I think for that it was relationships and people. And you know, we're both going into obstetrics and gynecology, and <laughs> I think our favorite part of the specialty, my favorite part of the specialty, is the people. So I think that's what the past few years really taught me. Teachings they take with them into their next chapter. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. Let's get a final check on this beautiful voting day, Colette. 
Yes, and Dwight, earlier in the show, I was talking about that pool of colder air in the eastern prairies that was kind of settling towards us and coming across the Great Lakes. So mild temperatures in Alberta, Saskatchewan, okay, it's sort of a split decision here, but look at Thompson, five degrees, Winnipeg, just 10 degrees, lucky to get to double digits there, and for Kenora there in northwestern Ontario, seven. So I'm not saying our temperatures are going to be like that. Our daytime highs are going to be very comfortable and some nice weather, the pattern that's coming up up for the next several days is really quite great, but it might be just a tiny bit in some cases below seasonal on some of those days. Okay, there are those showers working their way through. Not much to this. It looks a little worse on the radar in some cases than it actually is because it's not all reaching the ground. Where it is a little more significant and there are pockets of locally heavier downpours are with some isolated thunderstorm activity into eastern Ontario and that carries on through the overnight hours there uh, for the Ottawa region. So watching that very carefully for those folks, but here in the GTA, we have a beautiful evening and night, clear conditions, 12 degrees for the overnight low, but I will say there'll be a few spots around the Golden Horseshoe who will fall into those single digits. Earlier I was saying St. Catharines at 9 degrees will be some closer to 10. And tomorrow, hey, sunshine to begin, then clouds, a bit of cloud cover will build in. A few highly isolated showers will pop up again into tomorrow afternoon. Not like that line even going through today, less than that. 23 that daytime high with that breeze kicking in at least into the afternoon hours we'll see it kicking in from the south so there's your friday looking good saturday looking amazing and just a little dip with the temperature there as we head into the weekend very comfortable love the way always compare us to others to make us feel better about ourselves because <laughs> we could get out one degree they're seeing in churchill right now so thank you you Paula. noticed that You're i did welcome. notice that that is our show for tonight thank you for joining us there's just about two hours left Left until Ontario's election polls close. Some polling stations have had to extend their hours. You can find a list on our website at cbc.ca slash Toronto. We'll leave you with a look at the main party leader's headquarters. Join us back here at 8 o'clock. I'm going to see you in an hour for our pre-election coverage. And then join me and Vashi Kapalas at 9, along with Mike Crawley for CBC's election special. All the results and analysis coming your way. Have a great night, everybody. I'll see you back here in an hour.